Well, good morning, good morning again. Good, good morning. Good morning. Man. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. No, actually 16. I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong page. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Choices and preconceived ideas. In Luke chapter 16, verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray now that you would open our hearts and our eyes to let us be filled with your love and joy. Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be open to receive your word. And Lord, that you would be with us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Here we have a parable that Jesus told of two people. Now speaking to the Pharisees, and as you read the different commentaries and all, it was very likely that uh, the Pharisees knew the two people. Now who were the Pharisees? They were a hypercritical religious group that believed in their own self-righteousness. They put everyone else down. But they were supposed to be the spiritual people of the time. They bound people to outward signs, symbols, uh, fasting, giving, all kinds of heavy burdens. But they thought themselves pure. So we were talking about people this morning in Sunday school and a lot of the preconceived ideas. Well here, the Pharisees were full of preconceived ideas. You see, they looked at this rich man who had so much and they just knew that he was blessed of God. And he was blessed. He had an easy, cushy life. And this poor beggar laid at his gate would have been happy with just the crumbs. Just the part that a lot of us feed our puppy dogs. Yours may not be as full as mine, but he thinks when I eat, he should get a little bit. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He does. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the Pharisees' ideas were that this man must have been greatly of God to be in this condition. And you know we're like that today a lot of times. See people down on their luck, sick. I wonder what they did. That God did that to them. And they may have done absolutely nothing. I think of Job. You know why Job suffered all that he did? Because God wrapped on him. 
God said to Satan, Have you seen my man Job? For there is none like him in the land. And the devil said, Let me have him. And he'll curse you. Lost all his wealth. Lost his health. Never once did he curse God. Questioning, but he never cursed God. And he went through all of that just because God said, Have you seen my servant Job? Now, if we were going by today's stereotypes and all, we would have thought God, uh, that God had been displeased with Job. His three friends definitely thought so. That he had evidently sinned somewhere to be receiving such treatment. But the whole time it was based on the fact that Job was a loyal and faithful follower of God. The same type of thoughts were directed towards this poor man. He didn't have a house. He was probably covered in filthy rags and doesn't really say it. He was full of sores. And the dogs were coming to lick the sores. For a Jew, you could not paint a picture of a more abominable person. And I'm sure they were thinking, boy, what did he do in his life to deserve all that he's getting? Another man, the rich man, he had great food, had the finest clothes. He was somebody on the town. He would have been somebody that the Pharisees admired greatly and would have thought God had blessed him abundantly. He must be doing everything right. The truth between the two could not be further from the truth. It could not be further from the truth on the two when you looked at them. Now what do we think? Are we not judgmental also? When we go out and we look at people, and these days there is a lot to look at. We talked a little bit about tattoos and preconceived ideas about people with lots of tattoos. I only can learn, I don't know how they afford. But we get to looking at people and we have preconceived ideas. They don't have any food. But they ought to go get a job. That's kind of like telling people, you don't like the price of gas? Go buy an electric car. <laughs> I can't afford to pay for the gas. How they expect me to pay for the electric car? And then they're already telling me to bump my AC up because there's such a grain on the power grid. How are we going to plug in on electric cars and I'll get off that political hot topic before I get real wound up. Amen. But we never know what somebody is going through. Some people sitting out there, yeah, they need to get their bottoms to work. But other people out there are just down on their luck. 
can't tell by looking who's who. Now you bring them in and listen to them for a while, you might have a good idea. But we need to reach out to everyone. Especially people that we look at and kind of go, eh, I don't know about them. Because you know what? God could have done that to us. Romans 5 8 says, But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't clean when Christ died. Truth be told, most of us aren't clean now. We're just sinners saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace. So we need to be about helping our fellow man. Not passing quick judgments for people who maybe don't meet our moral standards our cultural standards because we don't know where their shoes have walked and until we walk a mile in their shoes or more we don't really know what they're going through I know right now times are getting tough. And it looks like it is going to get even tougher. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Some of the things they have in the works just blow my mind. There's an additive that they put in diesel fuel. The only one place makes it. Only one railroad can transport it. And the ones that own the companies, guess who they're tied into? If the little article was true, it all goes back to Biden and Obama and their counselors. What do we do without diesel? How do we get our food? Because diesel trucks that provide all this to the world and railroads. And I'm chasing another rabbit. I'm sorry. <laughs> but what do we need to do when we think? the thoughts we have. Because as we go forward, we see in verse 22, it says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. What? You mean that filthy old beggar? was received into the glories of heaven? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Escorted by angels? <coughs> Boy, there must be going to be a huge fanfare for the rich man. <coughs> In hell. So it was, then it goes on, the rich man also died and was buried. You notice just right there? There wasn't any angels paying fair. There wasn't any divine escorts into the gates of heaven. The rich man died and he was buried. John, it would be better for the rich man if it would have stopped there. Folks, we are created in the image of God. 
God breathed life into us. But He also gave us spirit and soul. A lot of people want to say we're just some biological engineer being that operates off chemicals and electrical impulses. No. God gave us life. God gave us a mind. We can think. We can reason. We can feel. And no matter how smart the animals are, they don't have everything that humans have. And when we lay down this shell, and that's what the body is, the body is a shell that we inhabit. Because when we lay down the body, we don't cease to exist. Remember, we're made in the image of God. And mankind was designed to live forever. To be an eternal being. And mankind will exist forever in one or two places. Verse 23, the rich man died, he was buried. Next we hear about him was, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. The story changed, didn't it? Lazarus was deprived in this life. He didn't experience all the good things that the rich man enjoyed. He died in a disheveled wreck. On his death, he was escorted by angels into the presence of God. Amen into Abraham's bosom. And there's a whole sermon on that. <clears throat> we don't have time right now. The rich man died. There was no fanfare. He was just buried. Remember, the body that was buried is just a shell that the rich man inhabited. The soul was designed to last for eternity. But he didn't wake up in Abraham's bosom. Said he woke up in Hades. That is a soft meaning for the word heaven. The rich man woke up in hell. And being in torments. Sure not. I mean, this man had to be blessed by God. He felt so sumptuous. He had everything. He had all the wealth money could buy. Or all the happiness and joy money could buy. He had luxuries beyond the imagination. But he lacked one thing. And that one thing was going to cost him his eternity. And he was in torments in hell. When everything is broken down to its final components, mankind is going to dwell one or two places. Either we're going to accept 
accept Jesus Christ and we're going to be with Him in heaven forever. All eternity. And if you can truly wrap your mind around that, you're better than me. If when I start breaking it down and you start getting to the fact that if a sparrow dropped and brushed its wing on a mountain of gold, Every year, by the time that mountain was totally worn away, we just begun. Just begun. I don't know if that helps y'all. It kind of helps me. Eternity is beyond our comprehension. We're finite beings. At least in these bodies we are. But when we leave these bodies, we are infinite. Not of our own, don't get me wrong. Because that's how God created us. Us. Not the body, us. That part of our body that is the mind, the soul, the spiritual. And then praise God, one day He's going to appear in the eastern sky, and guess what? Jesus Christ is going to restore our spirit to our glorified body. And we'll have a body like His for all eternity. What are we going to do? We're going to serve Jesus Christ. If I read the back of the book, right? We're going to praise God for the time that the earth's in the most terrible tribulations that have ever been known. And then when Jesus comes back for His second coming to establish His kingdom on earth for a thousand years, guess who's going to be there with Him, serving Him? We are. Now exactly what we're going to do, I don't know, but we're going to be priests and servants of Jesus Christ in this new millennial kingdom where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. Well, Brother Rick, that ain't, that ain't much compared to eternity. No, it's not. Because after the thousand years where Jesus fulfills promises that He made to the Jews about the land, and the dead in hell are judged, then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where the saints of God are going to dwell with Jesus Christ for eternity. Amen. Amen. That's right. So for everyone who thinks and looks and says, well, I don't know why God lets that happen. I don't know why He doesn't just do away with sin. I don't know why He doesn't just restore it to the way it was back in Genesis before the fall. He is. God just works on a timetable that we can't yet understand. Amen. But He is restoring us to Himself. Now the poor man understood this. When he died, he was escorted by angels into what we would call heaven. The rich man was escorted by no one and woke up in heaven. But he wasn't quite convinced yet of his situation. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. He 
still had the idea that he had command. He still had the idea that Lazarus was a servant to be ordered around. He was in torment, but he was going to command Lazarus that he come and at least just dip his finger in water and cool his cup. But oh, how the times and turned. He was in torment in hell. This is a picture of what hell is actually like. We don't like to talk about it. I don't particularly like to preach about it because a lot of people don't like the subject. But it's in the book. And we have to preach and listen to the whole book, not just the parts we right. like. Amen. And Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Looks can be so deceiving. Because if they were taking votes among the people, everybody there would have voted that the rich man was blessed of God and surely was going to be accepted by God. I mean, look how he was blessed. But he lacked one thing. He lacked the proper knowledge of who God was and what it takes to be accepted by God. So in all his fanfare, all his lavish living, all the false teaching of the day, he was lost. And in hell, and in torment. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. You know, I imagine there's going to be some in heaven that if they could cross, they would cross to help their friends, family that never accepted Jesus Christ. Definitely those in hell would love to hear the gospel message one more time. One more time. This realization began to dawn on the rich man. He realized that he was eternally damned. And what is his concern? Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. See, once he's in hell, and he realizes it's too late for him. But his thoughts go out to his family. Father Abraham, I have five brothers. They're going to wind up in here with me. Send Lazarus back to talk to him. For if one comes back from the dead, Surely they'll believe. Now we have foreknowledge, don't we? Or past knowledge. We know more of the book. We know that Jesus Christ did come back from the dead.
Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they have the Word of God. Same that we have today. We have the Word of God. And we have an obligation to go and tell the world the truth about God. Whether the world accepts it or not, God has said to us, go therefore into all the world. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. God did grant that someone came back from the dead. The first born of the dead, you may say, well, people were raised before. Yeah. There were people who were raised from the dead, but they had to die. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He was victorious over Trump. Hell, death, the grave. He is who we must testify of. Jesus Christ is the one who came back from the dead, never to die again. And by doing so, He won the victory over the grave, over hell, and over... I just went blind. Sin. If a person will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, no matter what our situation here on earth is, we are guaranteed, not by me, we are guaranteed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that we will be in heaven with Him for all eternity. Amen. God said it, that settles it. I believe. Amen. My belief doesn't settle it. The fact that God said it, settles it. Okay. And all the choices we make on earth, there is one choice that is absolutely essential for eternity. And that is to accept Jesus Christ. Well, Brother Rick, everybody in here has claimed to accept Jesus Christ. Wonderful! It's our job to go out to others. Go to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. That's another sermon. Because the choice is eternal. And to not make the right choice can wind a person separated from God in Him for all eternity. So it's our job, if a choice has to be made, to make sure that they have the information to make the proper choice. That's right. We can't save anybody. That's between a person and God. That's right. But we can make sure that they lovingly have the information to make that choice. And that's why we're still on earth. We can praise God better in heaven. We're all going to 
Odeon Key. We can fellowship better in heaven. But once the choice is made and we're in heaven, we can't lead anybody else to the Lord. Because everybody that's going to be with the Christians is already saved. But here, that's the one thing we can do better is lead someone else. Or at least make sure that they have the knowledge to make their choice. I don't know what God has laid on your heart today, but I just pray you will be faithful. Pray for our country. It needs prayer like never before. Be in constant prayer for the church, our church family. We all need prayer. And be in prayer for a lost and dying world that we might be a mouthpiece for God. Amen. Alright. 195. What if it were today? <laughs> One ninety five. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power and love to reign. What if it were today? Coming to claim his chosen bride. All the redeem and purify.